some more people rolling in. Um, if you guys, at the end of my lecture, maybe I'll put this QR code back up. There's also some in the front of the room right there. So you guys can grab those as well. That's just for signing. We're just going to do that for signing in. Um, don't worry. If you guys didn't get it, don't worry. I'll come back to it. So I'll get to maybe some time. So today I'm going to start to talk about uh, empiric antibiotic management. Oh, I'm going to click on that. Yeah, yeah you guys are good? Okay. Uh, so I mean, I made this up. This is what I call the rectangle of infection management. It's kind of lame, but this is like the four things you really want to think about anytime someone has an infection is, uh, you know, first thing we're going to today is antibiotics, but you always want to consider source control. Um, you always want to think about risk factor reduction. Is the patient on immunosuppressive med medications? Are they severe diabetic and that's putting them at risk? Do they have lymphedema and that's giving them cellulitis? Uh, and always think about some supportive care being through the pressors. But like I said today, did you want to click it? Oh, is it? You just got to click on that. Today, we're just going to be talking about antibiotics. That's all we're talking about today, just antibiotic management. Uh, so I'll start reading the first question for you. So patient 63 year old male. Uh, and these are all real, real, real uh, patients that I saw on the floor, um, just to make it kind of more realistic. Uh, he has a past medical history of multiple myeloma. So he was being treated with like Cyborg D, uh, which basically is uh, including dexamethasone. Um, it's been complicated by recurrent infections in the past, never had a drug resistant infection though. Um, and he's been on IVID treatment. Uh, so he presents to the hospital with fevers, chills, lightheadedness, uh, without really any localizing symptoms. Um, never had any history of MDRO or broad spectrum antibiotics in the last 90 days. Um, on exam, his or vitals wise, his sinus packed at 120. His blood pressure is 79 over 42. Uh, respiratory rate was 24, and he was 98 percent over room air. Um, physical exam, he's confused. Uh, that's not his baseline. Um, his baseline is A-N-O times three and conversive, but he was really only oriented to name. And he's having uh, rigors without really any other localizing physical exam finding. His labs has an AKI of 1.8, a lactic acidosis of six, and a white blood cell count of 17. Uh, I'll let you give you guys a minute uh, to think about this, but what, you know, what do you want to give this patient? You want to give him uh, bank zosin? Just zosin. You want to give him bank zosin and his rubra? Or do you want to do it really big and give them bank marrow and an indigenous budget? So I made these tough, and I think you may not really know a lot of these answers yet, but that's why we're going to go through it. So everyone just kind of think about it. You can talk a little bit, just give it your best guess. <laughs> 
Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'll try to. I'll try to make sure. But I'm just saying, like, you need an hour. I was not going to I mean, it's definitely fine for the patient too, though. Yeah, I just mean like the AKI. Oh, AKI, yeah. Because yeah. he said, you know, like you could, you could throw that out there. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. All right. So, uh, would you just with the show of hands, who thinks they would go with A? Got a lot of A's. Who would think they would go with B? Got some B's. What about C? Anyone think C? All right, how about D? No. Okay, cool. So, I'm just kind of, <laughs> I'm just kind of going to go into, uh, like, clinical reasoning and try to think about these type of clinical scenarios. So, there's a good quote that says, uh, Medicine's art of probability and science of uncertainty, and there's no more truth to that when then when you're trying to figure out empiric antibiotics, right? You're used to doing board questions, and board questions there's always a right answer, or or um, but really in clinical medicine, you know, you can't be you can't be right 100% of the time, and you just want to make sure that you're kind of on the right side of your risk benefit analysis. So one of the clinical reasoning terms that I want to bring up is uh, patient's treatment threshold. And it kind of applies to this case because you're considering, do you want to treat this patient with broad spectrum antibiotics and how broad do you want to go? So when you're considering treating someone, I always used to think, you know, it's just based on what your clinical suspicion, but clinical suspicion is high, I treat, low, I don't treat. But there's a lot of other things that you really need to think about um, when you're thinking about whether to treat someone or not. Um, so just kind of going through these, uh, the first thing I want to talk about is uh, what is this patient's probability of having a drug-resistant infection? So what kind of things do you guys think about that increases your probability of having a drug-resistant infection? Yeah, so like current hospitalization, right? So hospitalization lasts 90 days. Yeah, prior drug-resistant infections. Actually, yeah, infection in general, but specifically prior drug-resistant infections. So you really want to always want to look at the patient's cultures in the past to see if they ever had a drug-resistant infection. So those are two, two major ones. Um, yeah, and recent antibiotics. I think those are like the three that I would probably majorly think about. So yeah, the first, the first one we talked about is hospitalization antibiotics in the last three months. Kind of always use a cutoff in 90 days. I don't really know why. Um, someone said a prior cultures of drug resistant infections as well, or colonization. Did they have a MRSA swab in the past that was positive? That's always something to consider, especially with uh, pneumonia. Um, and then one that you may not think about is organism specific risk factors. Uh, and say renal disease patients for some reason will a lot of time are at risk for MRSA bacteremia, likely because they're going to dialysis and they're getting their skin punctured over and over again when they get dialysis, um, as well as crowded living. And the one to always think about for pseudomonas is like bronchiectasis, especially cystic fibrosis. Very, very high risk for pseudomonas in those patients. The last one is like, do they just have a typical presentation? An example of this is like patients with MRSA or MSSA, they'll usually, uh, they can have cavitary pneumonia and pyema, and a lot of times they'll be post viral. The next one to think about is what is the potential benefit of therapy? And this is also like, what is the potential for adverse outcome? Um, so higher benefit for broad spectrum is patients, if you choose wrong, will they die, right? So if you make an incorrect decision, are they at high risk to die? Uh, and patients that that's the case for are patients who are like severely septic. If you pick the wrong antibiotic and they're severely septic, every hour that they don't get the correct antibiotic, it's 8% increased risk of death. So in those cases, you really just want to make sure you're on the right end of the risk benefit analysis, and it's going to really push you to treat with broad spectrum, even if you're not that clinically suspicious, and it's going to lower your therapeutic threshold. Uh, Immunosuppress is another one, and lack of source control. And then just risk of therapy. So, so what are some risks of antibiotics, right? Um, C. diff, you're going to see it all the time here. Um, huge risk, as well as uh, getting an AKI, too. Um, and then also just having any adverse reaction uh, that's specific to that antibiotic. All right, so going back to this patient. Uh, so 
What are some things that this patient has that uh, will make broad spectrum antibiotics uh, more beneficial? Or what is, what is this patient uh, likely, to, like is this patient at risk for decompensation? Yeah, I'm getting a lot of shakes. Yeah, so this patient's like basically severe sepsis, has an AKI lactic acidosis, almost on the verge of septic shock. Um, so going through, this is gonna be our algorithm. The first step in the algorithm, I think when I see an infection, is does the patient have end organ dysfunction? If the patient has an organ dysfunction, you're gonna have a lower uh, treatment threshold to treat with broad spectrum antibiotics. And this is actually basically uh, what we teach with our hospital guidelines as well as IDSA guidelines. Um, and what you'll see on up to date is that basically any patient who's septic with end organ dysfunction, your benefit, uh, your potential benefit of treating broad spectrum is so high that all these patients are going to get MRSA coverage, pseudomonal coverage, and then they're also going to get actually double pseudomonal coverage. Um, and this has actually been researched a lot of times. Um, there's a good, a couple good, uh, a couple good articles in BMC on infectious disease um, that actually shows that patients will for empiric coverage before you know what's growing. Double pseudomonal coverage in this patient has a lower mortality risk. Um, going back to the question, like, do we need fungal coverage? You know, I wouldn't say so in this patient. I don't think anyone raised their hand which for an individual fungus, which is good. There's not really good guidelines on when to cover. Uh, for like Canada is, uh, is the patient, so Canada is usually in the upper GI tract. So the patient have like peritonitis, they have abdominal fur. Is the patient on TPN? And the big thing uh, is, is the patient uh, neutropen, which this patient has none of, right? Uh, and then ESBL, sometimes you will think of this, that this is especially with our uh, antibiogram in this hospital, we do have ESBL. So someone who gets like severely septic from an infection in the hospital, that sometimes you'll cover ES, you will cover ESBL. Um, high risk staff will cover ESBL here. And then ESBL is very commonly in the urinary tract, so we'll cover ESBL here. I don't know which this patient has. So the correct answer, I think a good amount of people, actually, is actually C. So you are gonna want to double cover pseudomonas, and our hospital antibiogram picks for tobermycin. That's the one you're gonna use, because most pseudomonas here is gonna be susceptible to tobermycin. This case was interesting, because this patient was actually, had pseudomonas bacteremia, and it was intermediate to zosin, so actually giving this single dose of tobramycin uh, was really helpful. It was kind of a weird case. Uh, we actually think that he had a GI translocation of pseudomonas, which is why he didn't really have any localizing signs or symptoms. And he actually ended up having this. Does anyone know what this is called? What's that? Yeah, it's an SCARB. It's simply for pseudomonas bacteremia. This is a hard question. Uh, Exthymic gangrenosa. Yeah, so you actually end up having that too, which is kind of interesting. I didn't throw it in there at the beginning because I didn't want to like confuse you guys too much. <laughs> All right, uh, next patient. So station 62 year old, past metal history of hypertension, high cholesterol, diet controlled diabetes, come in with a fever and a headache. Um, he's spread about a 102, he's tacky. Uh, he has a really bad headache. Um, when you kind of move his neck, he has really bad men, uh, men, meninges, meningismus. Men, um, he's not altered at all, doesn't have any neurodeficits, um, no recent antibiotic exposures, no recent surgeries, no history of drug resistant infections. Lactate labs are all normal, other than a white count of 18. Uh, what, so what do you think is going on with this patient? This first question. What, do you, what kind of infections do they have? Yeah, meningitis. Yeah, exactly. All right, so what would you treat this patient for? Um, and I'll give you guys a little bit to talk about it again.
It's like it's really for what your job is. Like, you know, like why are you in this? Yeah, exactly. Right? Like, why is why can't we just be a computer? Right? Come up with that. All right. So who thinks uh, A for this patient? We got some A's. Who thinks B? Got some B's. Who thinks? Got a lot of B's. Who thinks C? Good, no C's. And then who thinks D? Got some D's as well. All right. I think what's getting everyone is do we do AMP or not? And we'll get, we're going to get into that. That's why we're here. All right. So uh, just for meningitis, and I put up the grand things to help you, what kind of organisms do you think of? Yeah. Bacteria. Bacteria. Absolutely. And then one last one. H flu. H flu. Yeah, H flu as well. Yeah, H flu. Yeah. So exactly. That's strep pneumo, H flu, Neisseria. And what about this one? It's a gram positive rod. Listeria. Listeria. Yeah. And I think the hard thing we had here is when to cover listeria or not. Um, so really anyone who is age greater than 50, you're going to cover listeria. It's actually, I was kind of surprised by that, to be honest. I was pretty actually young, but you think about older patients, but the cutoff is actually 50 years old. Um, does anyone know why we use vancomycin? And I'll give you a hint. It's not because of MRSA. Yes, exactly. Strep pneumo resistance. Yeah. Uh, or sorry, penicillin resistant strep pneumo. That's why you actually cover vancomycin. So I think some people said cefepime. Um, so when you cover cefepime for meningitis, it's actually only in patients who recently just had a neurosurgical procedure or they're immunosuppressed. So this patient um, was not immunosuppressed. There's no immunosuppression within the um, history. Uh, so for these patients, you would just go bang cefepime. Um, and, if you're, and if they're immune compromised, you would add ampicillin uh, as well to cover listeria. So anytime someone's immune, age greater than 50 or immunocompromised, add ampicillin, but if uh, cefepime is specifically for, for immunocompromised or if they had a recent neurological procedure, right? So if they had a recent neurological procedure, they're hospitalized, their microbiome can, respect, can kind of reflect the hospital. So you're gonna have to cover MRSA and you're gonna have to cover pseudomonas. So, um, and why ceftriaxin, does anyone know? And why not like Zosa? Yeah, see now. So Navi just had a really good thing. He said uh, cephalosporins think cephalat, right? They go, they penetrate the CNS. A lot of your penicillins don't really penetrate the CNS that well. So anytime you, you have on the differential a CNS infection, uh, do not use uh, Pepeto. Right? And then always, uh, in any person you want to do that has, you think has meningitis, always use dexamethasone. Um, Ten percent it decreases their mortality actually by ten percent. Um, only specifically if they have strep pneumo, but just got to remember that you have to give it with the first antibiotic or else it doesn't work. So anytime that's on your differential, always give dexamethasone. The, the thought process is that basically decreases like inflammation in the brain, which puts you at higher risk for um, having like a poor out, having increased morbidity like hearing loss or even increased mortality like uh, increased ICK. So good. I think a lot of people got that one. All right, next question. Uh, Seven-year-old female, past medical history of hypertension, GERD. She comes in with fever, shortness of breath, reductive cough. Um, she's not been hospitalized. Uh, she's not been taken any antibiotic recently. No history of drug-resistant infections. Test X-ray is shown right there. Uh, she's febrile, but her other vital signs are stable. She's alert. She's able to converse. So, what would you want to treat this patient uh, with? Bank ceftrax and azithro. Ceftriaxin and azithro, vancepepine levoquin, or vancepepine and azithro. So I'll give you guys a couple minutes for this one too. Oh, yeah, I, 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 I,
do you want to cover? What's the two broad categories of organisms you want to cover with CAP? Typicals and atypicals, right? All right, so what do you kind of usually use for just typical infections? Uh, what kind of antibiotics? Yeah, third generation septicephalosporins. I mean, you can use a unisam, but really in this hospital, we most, mostly use septriaxone. Um, and then how about, uh, let's see, how about for atypicals, what do you kind of, what do you usually use? Yeah, so macrolide, yeah, and typical is being, you know, uh, Legionella, uh, as well as um, Chlamydophila and Mycoplasma. For these ones, macrolides, and if not macrolides, chloroquinolones or doxy. Uh, so those are the three things, but really we'll use uh, azithromycin first line. You can use Leviquin and CAP to cover all these, but it does have a decreased efficacy compared to ceftriaxone and azithromycin. All right, so that's kind of when we go for CAP. So this is a hard one, right? So you know, there used to be that thing called HCAP that kind of went away. So with CAP, when do you cover MRSA and when do you cover Pseudomonas? Um, so this will be kind of complicated, but really what you're really looking at is, is it presenting like a MRSA pneumonia or do they have any risk for a MRSA pneumonia? Um, so presenting like, I kind of want this before, like cavitary pneumonia, post-viral pneumonia. Um, does it have an empyema? Uh, and then risk factors for MRSA is usually crowded living situations. Um, as well as end-stage renal disease, like I said before. Really, if they have any of that, um, or obviously if they're very sick, where you would actually already be on this part of the algorithm, um, you would want to add vancomycin. Pseudomone is a little bit difficult too, so when you cover pseudomonas for CAP, um, really kind of similar to MRSA is like, do they have a risk, risk factor for it? Big risk factor being severe lung disease, especially either bronchiectasis um, with like cystic fibrosis, or another one that they use is actually uh, the microbiome of uh, patients with severe COPD actually changes after long-term long -term use of like steroids and antibiotics. They are at risk for pseudomonas as well. In those cases, you'd actually do, uh, there's the way that you would actually go about it is you would double color for pseudomonas and you would do something like cefepime or zosin. And then with your getting your atypical coverage, you'd actually use a fluoroquinolone. So that's just kind of like some kind of nuanced uh, treatment for CAP with, risk, with, with pseudomonal risk factors. Um, and then obviously on top of that, like, did they get antibiotics in the last 90 days uh, in that case, or hospitalized in the last 90 days? In that case, you would cover both of these as well. And do they, were they ever colonized from it? A lot of things to think about, but. The next is HAP and VAP. So these are different. This is only patients who are hospitalized for greater than 48 hours. It takes about 48 hours from their microbiome to reflect basically the uh, bacteria of the hospital. And those patients, you're always gonna give Vanco, you're always gonna give an anti-pseudomonal, beta-lactam, something like Zosin, um, Cefepime, less likely meropenem. Um, but if you think they're really, really sick or if they have kind of those MDR risk factors that we just talked about, you do wanna double cover pseudomonas. And if, if that, then you want to do meropenem because we do have ESBL organisms in our uh, in our ICUs here. So that's our kind of our hospital guideline. If someone has VAP and you think that they have increased mortality risk, they're like septic or they just you know don't look too bad, or if they have any of those risk factors for pseudomonas, you actually want to give them uh, you actually want to give them meropenem um, for ESBL coverage. All right, 
So Seth Track, so you guys are right. This is a typical cap. This patient's you know never had MDRO in the past. Um, they're not severely sick. Uh, they've never been colonized by anything before. They don't have a typical MERS infection, uh, and they don't really have any risk factors for like pseudomonas, right? Perfect. All right, we're almost. I think we got about two more. Um, does anyone else want to read this? Is that all right? Someone. Patient is a fifty-year-old male. You guys think this is that I got put an image of? That's your sigmoid colon. Just give me that. And it's inflamed with some alpha pouches. Anybody? There we go. Diverticulitis. Yeah. So this patient's coming in with diverticulitis. So uh, I'll let you guys talk about this again. Then we'll then we'll go over it once you're done. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. Should I even forgot to tell you this? Of course. <laughs> so I, I, you did it. Okay, oh, good. <laughs> Kind of stuff lives in your abdomen. So, what kind of just general uh, classes of like bacteria live in your abdomen? Gram negative and anaerobes. Actually, I think really if you think about gram negative and anaerobes, you're covering 90% of it. Um, the other one to think about, it's going to be present in your urinary tract as well as in your GI tract, is going to be this gram positive toxide here. Um, anyone know what this is? Yeah, and pericoccus, right? Um, so that, that can be there as well. And also strep ovis, I didn't put it up here, but strep ovis can be there as well. Like the typical presentation is like, patient comes in with strep ovis bacteria, you always gotta do a colonoscopy because they could have some sort of uh, GI malignancy. Um, so what kind of stuff do you wanna cover? All right, so let's kind of go back to that question. So ceftraxone and metronidazole. So ceftraxone, really good coverage of gram negatives, metronidazole, but you guys always think about cephalosporins. There's like that old lame mnemonic um, that was in uh, like, like step was on step one. So cephalosporins do not cover listeria, atypicals, um, especially for cat. Remember that uh, mycobacteria, which is obvious, and then E is in pericoxide. So cephalosporins don't cover those four kind of bugs, um, and they also don't cover uh, anaerobes. So anytime you're thinking about it you need to cover anaerobes, um, you really always have to add on metronidazole. Uh, piptazo and metronidazole, I threw this one in here to confuse you guys. So piptazo already covers anaerobes, uh, so you don't need the metronidazole. 
Cipro only covers gram negatives, so you would need metronidazole if you're using Cipro. And then Cefepim um, does cover pseudomonas, uh, and then metronidazole, and then also doesn't cover anaerobes, while metronidazole covers only anaerobes. So which one do we really want to do here? Um, so I think it's really between kind of A or D with the things I just mentioned. And this kind of goes into like, when do you add on pseudomonal coverage for an abdominal infection? Um, and honestly, I didn't know this that well until I looked it up. Uh, so this page, so things that you consider is like, is this a low risk patient or a high risk patient? And it's kind of all the things we talked about before, right? Um, is, you know, do they, have they been treated with antibiotics in the last 90 days? Um, have they been colonized with a drug resistant bacteria or they grew a drug resistant bacteria in the past? Um, do they have those specific risk factors for pseudomonas or MRSA? Um, and then on top of this, um, any of those things would make this patient high risk. On top of this as well, the patient's even like older and you don't have source control. In those cases, you would cover uh, for pseudomonas. So a patient's high risk of abdominal infection, kind of all those things I talked about as well as if they're older, age greater than 70, or if you don't have source control, you do want to cover pseudomonas for those patients. Um, does this patient have any of those risk factors? I'm seeing some shakes. No. Yeah. So this patient, you know, is 50 years old. They don't have any history of immunosuppression. They don't have any specific risk factors. Um, there's no recent antibiotics. They haven't been hospitalized recently. You can really just do uh, A for this patient, right? You don't really need to cover pseudomonas because they would fall in this low risk category of uh, intra-abdominal infection. Um, one thing to think about, if you ever, if you ever want your beta-lactam to be a cephalosporin, just make sure you always add metronidazole, all right? Or fluoroquinolone. If it's, your base is a kind of fluoroquinolone or a cephalosporin, they do not cover anaerobes and you gotta add metronidazole. This one cut off a little bit. Uh, I wouldn't, and then you don't actually, the interesting thing is you don't actually always have to cover enteric oxide as well. Um, Zosin will cover enteric oxide, but if you're, um, using a cephalosporin, you really only have to add it um, if it's a hospital acquired infection, which I didn't actually know before this. So those are kind of the things to consider when you're thinking about a low risk abdominal infection versus a high risk and when to actually use an anti pseudomonal or not. This patient was not required. All right, uh, I think this is our last question. Um, this one's going to be the hardest one, I think, so far. Can I ask uh, you about the previous one? Yeah, yeah what's up, man? So I, I picked D. Yeah. I the seven theme, not because of the pseudomonal coverage, because I figured as a fourth generation, it would be, it would have less gram positive activity, gram negative, but the ultimate So, Seth, so really when you're thinking of broad spectrum, the big things that you probably should be like thinking about is like, do they cover pseudomonas or not cover pseudomonas? That's like really the major problem that we're like concerned about. Um, ceftriaxone will cover pretty much all your gram negatives and also cover some gram positive, like uh, beta strep as well. Um, Cefepime will cover kind of all that, but then we'll also add on um, a little bit of pseudomonal coverage. So it is a little bit more broad spectrum because they cover pseudomonal. The thing that you're really worried about is like giving these patients these broad spectrum antibiotics, especially pseudomonas, which is so common in the hospital, is that are you kind of predisposing them to develop further drug resistance? which Cepapine would do because you would be actually kind of, select, you could be selecting for a resistance to pseudomonas. And that's one of the major things we're concerned about. But yeah, you're right. I think you're right. Cepapine does have a little more gram negative. Ceftriaxone has, I think, a little bit more gram positive. But in this case, yeah, really Cepapine is always going to be more for one infection than Ceftriaxone. All right, last one. Can anyone read this for me? Patient's a 70 year old female, and past medical history of cervical myelopathy, constantly with nerve and fire, and the current UCI is not complete, hospital with fever, still wider, tight neck pain. She has had drug resistant UTIs in the past, most recently one month ago. She is tachycardic with blood pressure of 85 over 50, and last, she has a laxative. The patient came in for fluid or fluid. You guys, some minutes, and then we'll. Go over this. Oh, I have two more. Oops.
This is uh, hydro, so they're obstructed as well. But um, anyway, who thinks, uh, so they have basically have an obstructive UTI. So who thinks A for obstructive urosensors actually? All right, who thinks B? Who thinks C? And then who thinks J? All right, what kind of, what, thought, what made you guys pick C? Anyone? Yeah, yeah, so that's actually yeah, kind of a risk factor in patients that actually have a, uh, that have urosepsis obstruction, right? It's going to be hard to get source control. You're going to need source control as quick as possible. That's one thing that maybe will kind of switch you to do something that's much more broad spectrum. This is about as broad spectrum as it gets, per se. Anything else that makes you think that this patient's at risk for a drug resistant infection? Yeah, so she's had history of drug resistance. Um, she's got recurrent U UTIs in the past. And then what? Is do you think this patient at risk for decompensation and death? Yeah, absolutely, right. So she's this, she was tacky. She had a lactate of eight. Um, you know, she definitely had signs of end organ dysfunction, meaning that yeah, you know, every hour that you don't pick the right antibiotic, eight percent increase in mortality. Perfect. So what kind of stuff? Uh, what kind of bacteria will usually cause like pylo or complicated UTIs? What's some what's some ones that you kind of think of? Yeah, E. coli is like 80%, right? So it's E. coli, and then you kind of think about think about other gram negatives. Um, think about Klebsiella, Proteus, Pseudomonas. Much more likely than Staphyloprotocus uh, or like enteric oxide. Honestly, I don't even think I've ever seen Staphyloprotocus in the hospital. Though you do get tested, that it's a common one with um, female, younger females that get um, UTIs, probably because they don't get sick enough to come to the hospital. Um, all right, so. You know, this patient, so basically your low risk patients, you know, if you have someone who comes in, they're not severely septic, they don't have a history of drug resistant infections, um, you know, they're not obstructed. And a lot of these patients you can just cover with ceftriaxone or fluoroquinolone and call it a day. Um, but really when you start thinking um, about EFBLs, the most common place that you'll find an extended, extended spectrum beta lactamase, um, like either like E. coli or Klebsiella, is actually going to be in the urinary tract, um, especially in someone who's had a history of recurrent infections and recurrent antibiotics. So this patient's very, very sick, very high risk for an ESBL, which is becoming actually more common every year. Um, so you would actually give this patient Meripen. So when to give bank for patients with urosepsis? I mean, you don't really think about MRSA um, when you kind of think about the urinary tract, but if the patient's septic uh, with, um, and organ dysfunction, or if they're obstructed, or if you have a gram positive stain, then you add back. So everyone was right, these two, and then this patient kind of also falls in this category, right? So you got to double cover the pseudomonas. So I'm happy everybody got it right. All right, so this one, I'll just go through kind of quickly, um, since we're almost running out of time, I don't want to cut the knobby <laughs> stuff. Uh, so you two, two weeks on your inpatient ED rotation, uh, you have a 28-year-old IV drug user presents the ED with pain in his arm near an injection site. 
you ultrasound it, you find out it's a fluid collection of three centimeters, lance, drained. Um, but you see that he has some surrounding cellulitis around it. Uh, patient doesn't look too sick. I mean, they're in pain, but uh, their labs are you know, normal other than a white count of 13. So what antibiotic regimen would you choose? Um, so just by a show of hands, who thinks A? Got some A's, who thinks B? B's, who thinks C, C's, and who thinks F flat? All right, this is good. I feel like we had like 25% on each one. So <laughs> what, uh, what are the two bacteria that cause cellulitis? Yeah, so strep and uh, MSSA or MRSA, right? Those are your two things that you're really considering covering. Um, so the first thing you really want to think about when you have someone with cellulitis uh, is like, do I need IV antibiotics, right? So even if they're just febrile um, or if it's kind of like rapidly getting worse or if they had some treatment for it already, you just want to start vancomycin, start IV antibiotics and do that until they kind of improve, then you can get them onto an oral regimen. Um, this is a question you'll get on the, uh, you'll kind of get all the time. Obviously if they're severely septic, you want to kind of do this, but um, if you do see any skin necrosis or if you have some concern for things like corneas being green where it's around the mucous membranes, then you do want to cover your gram negatives. Uh, another common one too that you'll see in a patient like a diabetic with a foot infection. If you remember diabetic foot infections are going to be polymicrobial. Um, so there's times you do actually want to have zosin if it's like a diabetic foot infection that causes them cellulitis. Um, so they don't have any of the above. That's when you kind of divide these patients into purulent versus non-purulent. This is just kind of based on what you see clinically, right? So if they have a non-purulent infection, it's much more commonly that they have a strep infection. Um, so in those cases, you can just do Keflex, Clinda, Decloxacillin. Usually I think we use Keflex most commonly, um, but if they have a purulent infection, you have to cover MRSA and MSSA. In those patients, you oral, oral regimens you can use are Bactrim, Doxy, and Clinda. Um, the tough thing is, is that, so Clinda will cover um, strep pneuma. So Clinda will actually cover your strep, not strep pneuma, strep pyogenes, uh, as well as covering MRSA somewhat, but Bactrim and Doxy will actually not cover strep. And these three, and Keflex and Decoxacillin will not cover MRSA. So if you don't really know, you don't really know if it's pure or non pure I have seen people who just kind of give like either clindamycin or they'll do Bactrim and Keflex. Seen it before but usually it should be somewhat apparent, apparent on the exam. All right, so this patient just needed Bactrim. They weren't really febrile. Um, they didn't warrant vancomycin. They didn't warrant zosin as well. Um, and they were just lance and discharge from Bactrim. So just kind of going through this, um, if I give you guys anything for today, it's going to be, teach you really anything for this, it's gonna be this. And it's like, when, do you, when are you considering um, covering uh, drug resistant organisms. And these are the main things, right? So things that will change your pretest probability here, and then things that will lower your treatment threshold, um, being like a very sick patient, immunosuppressed or lack of source control. So anytime you're thinking about, do I need to cover more? Think about, you know, do they have a high pretest probability for having some of these drug resistant organisms? Um, and if they don't, like, how risky is it not treating them, right? If I get it wrong, will they die in the next day? Um, and if you think they might, then I would say just, you know, the broader the better. Um, so that is it. Um, and really when you think of clinical reasoning, it's not just based on clinical suspicion. It's based really on this treatment threshold, which is affected by your clinical suspicion, risk of therapy, and also potential benefit. Uh, I think that's all I got for you. Anyone have any questions? That was a lot of stuff. This is what you learn in all of residency. You don't need to know it now. Uh, don't be upset if you got some of these wrong. It's like, that's why you're here, right? All right, any questions before I end? Please send us the PowerPoint. Yeah, yeah, I'll send out the PowerPoint. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I think this, these kind of three slides are, this one, that and this slide is, is pretty helpful. <laughs> uh, so don't worry, I'll send this out, okay? Yeah. And I'll try to share them. We're, 
like recording it too on Zoom. I don't know if it's going to work, but we'll try to send out the video as well. Especially. <laughs> Anybody want to like stretch and before we get started? <laughs> you guys can uh, maybe think about this question, read this question, and just like stretch and relax before we get underway. Oh. <sighs> Brave souls. Okay, how about um, are we? Is that, is that the type of oh, yeah. Okay, uh, why don't I pose this question to them? What is going on? What's the diagnosis? Not the not the necessarily the answer to the question, but what's the diagnosis? What's that? I said lymphoma. Okay, so maybe lymphoma, but. Um, I guess, what do you call, uh, here, here, what we have, like, so I guess it's picking out the main points of the question here, right? Uh, we have a patient who has some sort of like, you know, concerning symptoms, sure, fevers, chills, night sweats, that, you know, these symptoms, as you kind of pointed out, are very high likelihood, right? Um, but then she also has, okay, she also has like facial, neck edema, she's got like a flush, there's maybe a um, <laughs> uh, but she doesn't have a lot of lymphadenopathy, whatever, right? Um, and then it shows like there's a mediastinal mass with compression of the superior renal cage. What is that called? SBC. SBC syndrome. Okay. So in SBC, what the essence of the question is, in this patient with SBC syndrome, how do you treat them? And um, I liked this question and I kind of changed some of the answer uh, choices here to kind of call it the process because these are the things that are always talked about when somebody has SBC syndrome or a compressive mass causing some sort of like danger bats. Um, going through this question, who thinks, uh, you know, just by like, this is in the short show again, who thinks the answer is A? Okay. Uh, who thinks the answer is B? Uh, who thinks the answer is C? D, uh, and E. Okay, okay, great. Um, great, so I really love this question because uh, this is something that if you're on green or blue medicine, it's something that you're gonna hear again and again. Uh, no meat, no treat, okay? So if you do not know what kind of cancer you're dealing with, you don't treat it. You, you can't give them, uh, what kind of chemotherapy are you gonna give them? You don't know what, what it is, right? Um, that also ties nicely into dexamethasone. Dexamethasone, uh, any steroid therapy, especially for types of lymphoma, is so effective. It's so cool. I love steroids, right? Uh, the only thing is, is if you don't know what you're treating, uh, and then you try to do a biopsy later, you kind of actually mess up the cellular structure of what you're looking at, and it can kind of ruin your diagnostic view. So, in non emergent situations, right? So, this patient does not have respiratory distress. So that's non-emergent SBC syndrome. In non-emergent uh, uh, situations, it's okay to hold off on steroids until you get the tissue biopsy. And then um, in this uh, particular case, you know, sometimes it's SBC syndrome from like a thrombosis, so maybe anticoagulation could be recommended, but of course there is no thrombosis, so that's why that's not the answer. And then as far as the stent is concerned, uh, again, the underlying issue is not because of the vein actually being um, you know, compromised, it's more from mass compression. So treating the underlying disease would be better move. Also, there's only one indication for uh, stent placement. You guys know, in SBC syndrome? It's when you think it's immersion, which is when you have respiratory distress. So if there's somebody who has respiratory distress, compression of that, um, you know, SBC, that mass causing, like, you know, literally they can't breathe, uh, in those situations, you can put like a venous tension in order to get like, you know, 
Uh, otherwise, we don't. So the correct answer here, only one person got it, uh, is, is doing a biopsy. So in a non-emergent situation, and the reason I, I, I chose this question is because it's not just applicable for SVC syndrome, it's applicable for some of our other oncological emergencies that we always worry about, cord compression, brain masses, that kind of thing. We'll see uh, if you're able to hold up, get a biopsy first, and then do treatment. Okay, all right, so if it wasn't obvious already, we're gonna be talking about oncological emergency. <laughs> um, so if you're on blue, uh, I would be paying attention. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> anybody else could think of that? Uh, all right, so the, I, I like to think of uh, oncological emergencies kind of broken down into four major categories. The first one is what we kind of just talked about, which is mechanical, and I think there's like that. So obviously one of these is uh, SVC syndrome. Can anybody think of other examples of like mechanical oncological emergencies? Or compression, right? Exactly. Um, and if it can happen, if that can happen in the cord, if you compress things in the brain too, your brain that's in certain situations can be considered like uh, emergencies. One that people always forget about is, is like uh, side effects of the cancer itself, you know, cancer not being known. All right, next is metabolic. What kind of metabolic oncological emergencies do you think about? Tumor lysis, love that one. Talk about that for sure. What else? Cushing's is, is one too, right? Oh, perfect, excellent, hypercalcemia. Yeah, those are like some of the main ones that we always think about. Hypercalcemia is incredibly common in oncological patients uh, And then another category is hematologic emergencies. What can you think about that? This one, what's that? Exactly, leukostasis. And I'll put that under the broader category of hyperviscosity syndrome. So really hyperviscosity syndromes, we're going to talk about them again later. It's like any component of the blood, if there's too much of it, you can make it a little too viscous. You know, can't, can't slide down those uh, capillaries that well. Also, I say capillaries, is that the correct pronunciation for Canadian? <laughs> Not capillaries. <laughs> that doesn't make any sense to me. All right. Uh, yeah, so, so um, exactly like you guys talked about, uh, uh, hyperleukocytosis, that kind of thing. Uh, DVTPDs can fit into this category as well, and um, the opposite of the thrombosis, your DIC, you know, uh, your bleeding diastasis, that kind of stuff as well. All right, and then there's the last one, the last category that we'll talk about today, which is infectious, infectious or inflammatory disorders that can be considered, um, you know, emergencies. Exactly, neutropenic fever, oh my god, so scary. So we'll talk about that as well. Okay, so what do we see here? What's going on? It's this guy. It's cord compression. Okay, great. Um, what kind of, when you see a patient who has a concern for cord compression, what kind of symptoms or physical exam findings do you worry about? Yeah, great. So some sort of local neural deficits. We always ask about like uh, bladder and, and bowel incontinence. So, you know, when you're evaluating somebody for cord compression, that's obviously some of the symptoms that you'll uh, look for. This is a big finding. Um, something else that uh, I wanted to bring up about cord compression is that it's actually pretty common. It's in about 6% of all cancer patients. Um, and the most common ones are your, your solid tumors. So uh, your breast, your lung, your prostate. Uh, and I have an echo if I get too close to that. Um, and then, of course, there's your, your multiple myelomas, that kind of thing. Um, your prostate cancers have more like osteoblastic lesions. Um, so that's why they cord compression in this population is actually relatively common. Um, and then the other ones actually cause more on the osteoblastic side. However, it's uh, the mass compression of an actual tumor can cause it. Uh, how do you treat cord compression? Steroids. Steroids, great. So steroids for us, you know, our first line therapy, um, to, uh, to reduce the edema, and in some cases, you know, if it's from a lymphoma or something like that, to actually treat the tumor itself. Uh, when it comes to steroids versus like neurosurgical stabilization, the outcomes from neurosurgical uh, stabilization are actually much better. So to try to push your, your surgical colleagues to actually treat cord compression other than just kind of local radiation or steroids. Um, because they can actually, uh, it seems like uh, as far as like three months out, six months out, um, there's a higher rate of being able to you know, go back to 
All right. Um, other examples of mechanical, we talked about this as well. Uh, brain masses, obviously, um, are always very concerning. They are also very, very common. They can happen in about 20% of um, uh, occupational steps through the solid tumor people, very similar breakdown of what type of cancers. Um, and then when you look at, uh, uh, when there's concern for somebody who has a brain that, uh, what kind of symptoms or patient presentation do you worry about? Nausea, vomiting. Nausea, vomiting, headaches, I think I heard seizures. So the teaching point here for, for our brain masses um, is, is related to seizures for, uh, for uh, us as well. So the treatment is related, it's very similar to um, uh, cord compression, right? Because it's CNS involvement of some sort of tumor. Steroids are helpful for reducing edema. We only give them if we're thinking about their act, just like cord compression in the brain, you could think about it as, you know, risk for herniation, that kind of stuff, neurological symptoms. Um, you'll often see neurosurgical colleagues saying, give them pepper. Um, the only indication for actually giving uh, an anti-epileptic drug in brain mex is uh, somebody who has seizures or had a history of seizures. Uh, there is no a recommendation, actually even from the neurosurgical like, guidelines, to give AEDs prophylactic to drug. So you see that all the time, but it's not actually recommended. Uh, right, and then this is for your guys' reference, so you, when you give, get the slides, you can think about some of the doses that we do and some of the agents, and then we can memorize those slides. There's something to refer to later. All right. Okay, so um, who wants to read the CKD? Yeah, this <laughs> is electrical alternate. So, um, Tim, what are you thinking? I'm thinking there's a tamponade. Right, a large pericardial effusion tamponade. I'm throwing that out there just to remind you guys that uh, mechanical. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, causes of like. A, you know, oncological emergencies extend beyond just the mass effect. Uh, you know, you can have like secondary effects or chlorofusion, start cardio effusion, causing like uh, organ compression. So, I'll think about that too. Um, since we're talking about EKGs, maybe we can think about this scenario, okay? All right. Now, everybody is Andy. Everyone's Andy right now. Get in there, think about it, okay? Um, you get this call from a nurse. Um, the patient at 3130 hasn't peed all shift, and he's a little bit more lethargic. Uh, we took his blood pressure though, it was normal, um, and we thought he might have some chest pain, so we got an EKG. Can you guys come up and see him? And then you look at your hand off. Um, doesn't seem like Nick really gave you a lot of information on the hand off. <laughs> you know, we gonna maybe talk about that a little bit later. <laughs> um, but yeah, you get something like, oh, maybe multiple myeloma, I don't know what's going on. Okay, so uh, she asked you to review the EKG, and this is what you find. You're like, oh man, that's a little blurry. Maybe we should repeat it. That's always my first action. Um, and so then you repeat it, and you get this EKG. <laughs> All right, so who wants to read this EKG? What's that? <laughs> okay, so I'm getting hyperkalemia out there. Okay. Anybody else? Let's think about it systematically here. Um, what's, the, what's the rhythm that you guys see? Yeah, it's probably sinus bradycardia, right? Axis seems normal. What do you guys think about the interval here? So, namely, the most weird one, at least in my mind, is does anybody think that that T wave is a little too close to the PRS? Right? What about these guys, right? Yeah, those T waves are kind of heaped, which I think is what, why Tim was like, what's going on there? Maybe it's hyperkalemia. But the other part about this too darn close. So this is something that I would say is QT shortening, right? Um, what condition can cause QT shortening and these characteristic kind of off-boring wave 
Hypothermia is one. It's an electrolyte recipient. It's actually hypercalcemia. Oof, it's a horse. Um, right, so hypercalcemia uh, can cause Osborne waves and um, or J waves. Uh, fun fact JJ Osborne was the guy's actual name. So if you ever get confused as to is it a J wave or an Osborne wave, they're the same thing. And his name is JJ Osborne. <laughs> Very cool of himself. Um, <laughs> So right, so it's so uh, you know some of the, the the things that we always have on our differential is like, well, what about hyperkalemia uh, uh, and um, uh, you know when it comes to hypercalcemia, that kind of thing. So I just thought it would be a good idea to show you some of the typical um, uh, findings that we have in hypercalcemia or hypokalemia. Uh, you know the high calciums and low calciums and the high calciums and low calciums, which you typically see in hypercalcemia. Is this QT shortening and the opposite in hypocalcemia. Uh, and then in hyperkalemia, you'll see that this QT prolongation happens in hypo, and then um, uh, you get this peaked T wave. So I, you also can get uh, Q wave, um, or sorry, QR restoration prolongation and depression of the T waves. So in, in hyperkalemia, I think of like the mnemonic for myself is goes down, the T wave goes down, the QRS goes over, QRS prolongation. And up, down, over, and up, and for, for, for hyperkalemia. And it's the exact opposite for hypokalemia. It'll go down uh, on the T wave side, over, so you still get QRX prolongation. You can sometimes get more peak T wave. Uh, another little diagram that I thought was helpful to remember calcium versus potassium is this guy right here. Uh, so you can just remember that as you approach this corner of the box, your, it, that's kind of your hyper and uh, hyperkalemia and hypo, hypercalcemia. And then as you approach this uh, direction, it's your hypocalcemia and hypokalemia. Um, I also uh, find it that I get a lot of these waves confused with each other because sometimes these uh, um, Osborne waves, it almost looks like a little bit like a delta wave. So just remember that your delta wave is on like the front part of the PRS. The Osborne wave is on the like kind of back part of the PRS. And then sometimes it can be confused with an epsilon wave, which we don't need to go into. But an epsilon wave um, is essentially like a late depolarization of some islands uh, of uh, myocytes in the right ventricle, which you can see in like right ventricular dysplasia, that kind of thing. So um, just keep in mind if you see a little blip in late in the QRS, that could be an epsilon wave, and an Osborne wave um, is on the uh, you know post QRS side, whereas the delta wave is on the pre QRS side. Any questions about that? We just went into a little bit of like random EKG tidbits because why not? All right, didn't think you were getting that during the talk, huh? Um, okay, so hypercalcemia also incredibly common. It's in thirty percent of, uh, of uh, cancer patients. It's the most common cause in patients who have like multiple myeloma, renal cell carcinoma, that kind of thing. Um, when it comes to a patient presenting with hypercalcemia, what kind of symptoms or signs of physical exam findings do you typically see? What's that? Yeah, so confusion. Great. Like it, stones. Definitely happens. <laughs> What's that? Yeah, stones, groans. I, th I think I'm getting the. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so yeah, some some other things to think about is uh, you know for our neuro peeps in the crowd, what happens to their reflexes? In hypercalcemia, what happens to your reflexes? So what Schwastik sign, or even like the inflation of the cuff, is in hypocalcemia. So in hypercalcemia, you actually have suppression of your, um, you know, your uh, uh, nerve conduction. So you actually get hyporeflexive, which is the opposite. Uh, and then in hypocalcemia, you actually get hyperreflexive. So just keep that in mind too. Fun, right? Um, some of the causes that we think about for uh, 
you know, hypercalcemia, just tied to the type of cancer, right? So it could be from bony destruction, it could be from PTHRP and things like um, small, uh, or squamous cell carcinoma in the lungs. Uh, another thing to think about is hypervitaminosis B actually can happen. Uh, you actually more commonly see this in uh, granulomatous disease. Uh, an example that everybody's familiar with, I'm sure, bilateral lymphadenopathy. You guys think I'm sure. Sarcoid, right, yeah. So sarcoid, that's from like the actual like granuloma producing vitamin D. So in other, um, so in some cancers, uh, you actually can get like a granulomatous uh, population, especially in lymphomas. So slow growing lymphomas can cause an elevation in your vitamin D level and cause like, a, like an insidious hypercalcemia. Kind of interesting. I think cancer is a wonderful. <laughs> no one else is going to say that. Uh, all right. So, like we were talking about, as you saw on the EKG, you get that QT uh, shortening, hyporeflexia, and bradycardia, um, and then treatment of hypercalcemia. So, what's the first line treatment of hypercalcemia that you see all the time? Fluid, 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 more fluid. The general, like, so. This is something I always struggled with as an intern. Fluid management. So we're gonna I'm gonna get on my little bit like of a soapbox when it comes to fluids for most people. What I personally do is I like to titrate any fluids that are going in to fluids that are coming out. And that's really your goal with most metabolic derangements across medicine, right? If somebody is very, you know, hypotensive from uh, shock or stuff like that. All you're trying to do is make sure that their kidneys and your organs are being well perfused so that you continue to make urine. So whatever goes in must come out. If it's, there's a mismatch there, then you're gonna run into trouble. So if you're giving them too much fluid, but they're not peeing, that's a bad thing. If you're not giving them up, if you're not giving them enough fluid and they're peeing out too much, you still need to match that output, right? So in hypercalcemia, and what you, what, it's a question I always ask myself, like, well, how much fluid do I give them? 100 cc's, 150, do we give them a liter? At the end of the day, it doesn't really matter as long as you're maintaining the urine output. Just remember that in the back of your head. When you are a senior or, you know, even when you go back to your floor and your senior asks you, well, what rate of fluids do you want to give? There's really no right answer if it's 80 cc's an hour or 125, um, you know, or 75. What you want to make sure is that you're getting the urine output that you want. So if you want them to be aggressively urinating, you want to probably give them more fluids, right? And if they're not meeting that output, um, then you need to give them other medications to make sure that I hope that made sense. Okay, so that's fluids. Uh, other medications that you can give in hypercalcemia? It's up there, that's big cloud. Right, so calcitonin. <laughs> calcitonin, <laughs> you can only give it for three days because uh, you get tachyphylaxis. Essentially, it's the receptors that is targeting uh, they get regulated, and so you can have diminishing returns. Um, and then, as far as the bisphosphonates are uh, concerned, you're going to see the use of zolendronate more often than midronate because one, it takes a little bit; it's a little bit faster, uh, so it has a better efficacy profile, uh, and it also has uh, less um, side uh, toxicity. So that's our something to that. In cases of hypervitaminosis B, remember what we talked about as the actual cause of those situations. You like to get steroids because steroids are very effective in lymphoma, right? So that helps me connect those two ideas. Why do I give steroids in patients who have hypercalcemia and vitamin D situations? That's because those, the vitamin D elevation is actually from more of a granulomatous process. And so you want to just break down the infl uh, inflammatory response there by giving steroids. Um, right. And then your last uh, line treatment for anybody who has hypercalcemia uh, is dialysis. And then this is a reference for you guys for doses and that kind of thing to when you have to spy. All right. TLS. Um, maybe I'll a lot to advance. Uh, the TLS. Who knows what the definition of TLS is? Or tumor lysis. Yeah. Hyperkalemic. Oh, great. Ooh, so we'll, we'll put it in that. So let's think about some of the electrolytes that get drained. So I got one here. Hyperkalemic. Right. Hyperuricemic. Okay. Hypocalcemic. Hyperphosphate. Yeah, 
Um, so perfect. Just keep in mind, so the uric acid goes up, right? The phosphate goes up, the potassium goes up. Full mnemonic there is UPP, right? So up, uric acid, phosphate, and potassium, UPP, it will up. The calcium goes down, so hypocalcemia. And that's actually because of the phosphate. So the phosphate, once you have phosphate release um, in your blood, you're gonna bind up calcium, um, and then so you're gonna have like, hypocalcemia. Uh, and then also from the, the endoplasmic reticulum being exposed to the like, milieu of outside, uh, you end up having like translocation calcium. Uh, so those are the typical metabolic arrangements. The definition of TLS is essentially you need two or more of those, uh, that increase or decrease the calcium supply uh, in that situation by 25%. So I actually don't memorize the cutoffs as much as I remember that it needs to be a 25% increase or decrease uh, from baseline. Now the definition, the difference between like the creatinine there is that's the difference between like a laboratory definition of TLS versus TLS, uh, you know, clinical TLS. Or clear, TLS like syndrome. So what we worry about um, is somebody developing like true clinical tumor lysis syndrome. The point of us looking and, and monitoring our labs so frequently and always looking for TLS is we don't want them to develop an API um, or, you know, progress to seizures. So similar to hypercalcemia, what is our first line treatment? Fluids. Um, in this specific case, it does kind of matter if you choose lactate, uh, lactated ringers or normal safe. Um, lactated ringers actually has four mole equivalents of uh, calcium in it. So you don't want to be giving somebody who has true tumor lysis uh, calcium, as there is a theoretical risk of binding potassium and crystallizing uh, calcium phosphate. Just keep that in mind. Um, that's with a grain of salt because it still is a low amount of calcium. So if you can, if, if you're developing like other toxicity from normal saline, uh, like hyper, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Hyporemia and the hyperchloremia acidosis is a risk factor. Keep that in mind. Um, all right. So when it comes to TLS, what I think about is it's a little bit more nuanced than, you know, just fluids. Uh, you kind of, first what you want to do is you want to break your patients who have PLS into uh, risk strat, you know, you want to risk stratify them into either low or intermediate high. What I mean by that is what kind of cancers, like what kind of patient population do you have so that you know what's the likelihood of developing them. Um, and based off of that likelihood, what kind of therapies or interventions? So what kind of cancers do you think are low risk for developing PLS? Yeah, most solid tumors, um, slow growing stuff, you know, CML, CLL, things that are growing slow, they're not going to have a lot of cell turnover when you're either killing them or on their own. Um, what about intermediate risk? This is the tough category, right? Like what, what is intermediate risk? You don't have to memorize this either, but the way I think about it is it's sometimes it's those like very bulky diseases. Um, and, uh, you know, like some of your non Hodgkin's lymphoma, if you have a lot of impact myopathy, they can be at like kind of a intermediate risk of PLS. Uh, and then your high risk, these ones are the ones that we always worry about. So, what kind of cancers do you see in your like, oh man, this guy can have PLS like right now for therapy? ALL. ALL. AML. What about maybe a young African American man who comes in with giant cheeks? Yeah, so Burkitt's lymphoma uh, is another one that is very high risk. So in those um, aggressive non-Hodgkin's lymphomas, like your defeat part T cells, your Burkitt's, AMLs and your ALLs, especially with like a high white count, uh, they are at high risk of developing fluids. Now, uh, treatment-wise, we talked about fluids. There's also medications that you can give. Uh, what medication do you give to essentially all patients with TLS? Exactly, allopurinol, right? Uh, one of the mo uh, most concerning, like really metabolites from TLS that you want to control is your uric acid, because that's what's really going to lead to a lot of uh, kidney injury, right? So in order to control the 
um, uric acid level, we start everybody off on uh, allopurinol. Fluids we already talked about, and tight print your fluids to your urine output. So just like I said before, if you're giving them 100 cc's an hour, then you should be getting 100 cc's per hour of urine output. Um, you know, have them on strict I's and O's. Uh, you need to, if you're noticing that the more fluids you give, the more urine output you have, that means you're still perfusing. Um, so you can increase the rate. But if you increase the rate and your urine output does not change, then you're um, hitting up against trouble. Uh, something that also always came up for me when I was on Blue One Two is like, well, how often am I checking TLS? In these patient populations, you end up checking TLS labs like probably once a day. You know, they're lower risk, and if they continue to be stable, space them out or not check them at all. For intermediate risk patients, it's essentially the same treatment, but you're watching more closely for TLS getting worse. If it does, you might need to, you know, increase the rate of fluids or uh, increase the dose of allopurinol and that kind of thing. And then in your high risk patients, this is where you actually can think of another medication to help clear your gas. Right, exactly. So uh, rasburicase um, can be added in these high risk patients. I do want to talk a little bit about rasburicase. Uh, rasburicase, uh, as we talked about, you know, so uric acid is the toxic metabolite, right? We want to decrease the amount of this in the body. So either we can decrease the synthesis of uric acid or we can turn uric acid into allantoin, which is like very, uh, you know, water soluble. And, you know, the takeaway here also is that allopurinol does not reduce the amount of uric acid. It just reduces the amount that's being produced. So you actually rely on your body to actually get rid of the uric acid that's already there. It doesn't help reduce, um, you know, anything that's already present. It only reduces the, the, like the continued synthesis of it. Rasburicase um, is quite expensive. These are kind of like some of our uh, guidelines here at Jefferson as to when we use it. Uh, we typically give a three milligram dose and we give it in patients who have very high uric acid levels. Maybe they've already had PLS syndrome with like a bad AKI with high uric acid. Those are situations that you'll see about your case used. Um, typically our cutoff is like about 15 or 18, depending on like what their underlying kidney disease is. <clears throat> what I will say is the evidence for rasburicase, especially in prophylactic use, this is in patients who have high risk disease, but don't have PLS yet. Um, there isn't a mortality benefit. Um, some guidelines still recommend it because there's a difference in like how many patients end up going on to dialysis and that kind of thing. And that's where you're gonna still see it used here in inpatient. Uh, but uh, allopurinol, or sorry, allopurinol is still the mainstay of therapy and rasburicase is, you know, because of its cost and that kind of thing. And it's hypersensitivity, uh, we use it sparingly. Also be cautious of using it in patients who have cancer. Okay, all right. You're calm, cool, collected, Krista. And you just got an admission. Oh my God, what is going on? It's some bozo who has like blurry vision, <laughs> epistaxis, a headache. Nurse is calling you again. I don't know why, but every time I stick him, he just like keeps bleeding. Um, and like now he's saying that his hands are numb. Uh, and like, we think he might be too weak. Like we tried to get him up to go to the bathroom and he like couldn't stand for us. So it's getting weird, right? Krista actually is an expert ophthalmologist, and she grabbed her ophthalmoscope and saw this. So, what do you guys think is going on? There's neurological symptoms. There's mucosal bleeding, and um, there's an underlying disease that can cause an elevation in your There's some end organ damage here too. You have these weird like sausage link kind of appearance in some of the veins. Does anybody know what this is? This is hyperviscosity. So in hyperviscosity syndrome, you kind of look for this triad, right? Um, you typically have uh, neurological findings, numbness, tingling in your extremities, or, you know, see an, you know, like stroke-like symptoms. Uh, you're going to have some sort of underlying disease that can cause hyperviscosity, right? 
So either uh, Walden's term is connected to global median, which is the most common cause, uh, or some sort of AML, ALL causing like leukostasis. Uh, and then you have some sort of end organ damage as well. Uh, here in the hospital, when, you, when you're concerned about uh, hyperviscosity syndrome, it usually is a reflexive call to um, ophthalmology to do a dilated exam to look for evidence of end organ damage. Because the most sensitive um, you know, exam finding is retinopathy. It happens, it, you know, you're able to like visualize the small uh, vessels in the body very clearly uh, on a dilated exam. Uh, the actual lab for checking a viscosity level on someone takes a long time. That's why we like to get opto involved earlier rather than later. So some of the things that we think about for hyperviscosity, you know, think of any underlying disease that places the patient at risk like Waldenstrom's, uh, your cutoff, hmm, all right, your cutoff as far as like your actual immunoglobulin levels, and this is something that again, you don't have to memorize, but it's a nice reference to have is like an IgA, uh, like a gamma uh, globulin um, uh, spike, you know, an M protein greater than four for IgM. So you can see that the cutoff for IgM is a little bit lower than IgG or IgA because IgA is the smallest immunoglobulin. So it makes sense that you need more of it cause um, hyperviscosity. You have this, uh, you know, typically like this triad with the numbness, tingling, the mucosal bleeding, and then, you know, the underlying disease. <clears throat> and the treatment, the mainstay of treatment is plasmapheresis. Uh, and just talking very briefly about what plasmapheresis is, because I always was confused. Um, really what the process of any sort of plasmapheresis is spinning the blood, separating it into certain density layers. Um, and then the machine itself is essentially able to suck up a layer based off of the density that you've chosen. So if you want to suck up all the RBCs, you can do that. Um, and then put new ones in, that's just called, you know, trans uh, exchange transfusion. If you want to just suck up a certain band of um, white blood cells, that's called leukophoresis. Same thing, right? If you wanted to suck up all of the um, immunoglobulins, you know, plasma phoresis. So that's really how it works. It's just spinning blood, separating it into densities, and then just targeting a specific layer to remove a specific either molecule or cell line. All right, and then I just wanted to make a comment that leukostasis, you know, very similar to hyperviscosity, a lot of similar like um, physical exam finding, and you're just targeting a different layer on the plasma freeze. Okay, uh, neutropenic fever. So what is the uh, definition of neutropenic fever? I wonder if they have to start with that. Did we, well, did we, did we talk a little bit? <laughs> no, I didn't play a chart, I promise. Um, <laughs> right, so exactly. So you have to have fever and neutropenia. Definition of neutropenia is less than 500. And then the fever definition is 100.4. Uh, either twice over the course of an hour or any one reading of 100. Um, neutropenic fever can be deadly, right? It's, it's, that's why we're talking about this. Um, neutropenic fever, uh, as far as the etiology is concerned, classically the teaching is that, you know, we're always very concerned about what causes gram-negative body. Right, so pseudomonas is classically, every, everybody teaches us that we need to worry about pseudomonas, we need to cover pseudomonas. That was the most common cause of neutropenic fever back in like the 80s, 90s, and even the early 2000s. But as like in, the, in the more recent decade, uh, the most common cause is actually gram positive organisms, which is weird. Uh, that doesn't mean that we don't cover for pseudomonas. I'm just putting that out there that um, there is now a slightly lower threshold to add vancomycin or gram positive, like worse, like more broad uh, gram positive coverage in your neutropenic. Uh, fever or neutropenic sepsis patients. <clears throat> so, um, what about fun fungi? When do they enter the fray in neutropenia? Okay, yeah, so um, in a patient who has neutropenic fever, if there is no response to the empiric antibodies that, antibiotics that you've given after about you know three to four days um, or even a week in some cases, uh, then you can think about adding antifungal coverage. But as far as your patient population is concerned, uh, it's the patients that have prolonged neutropenia 
that's when we worry about having a fungal infection. Uh, so somebody who has been neutropenic for more than a couple of weeks, or at least more than seven days, uh, are the patients that we try to say, hey, you're at an increased risk of having, you know, invasive aspergillosis or something like that. So you, we need to cover you up front for the fungal process that's causing your neutropenic Um But the empiric regimen that you're going to start, you know, go and call back to Nick's lecture uh, is some an anti pseudomonal gram-negative medication sometimes. Uh, and then you can add vancomycin um, in specific cases. So that neutropenic fever does not disobey the laws that kind of Nick has put in place for you, right? So if you have somebody who has like true sepsis, hypotension, a history of MRSA, blah, 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 any of those indications for Vanco, they're still, you know, a hospitalized patient with, um, you know, sepsis. So they, they still need vancomycin um, in those cases. Does that make sense? Okay, and then another kind of key teaching point that you'll run across on your Blue 1-2 services is the diagnostic yield of a chest x-ray. Uh, a chest x-ray in patients who have neutropenic fever, it doesn't have as much of a diagnostic yield because they don't have neutrophils. Um, an a, a infiltrate in a normal patient essentially is pus, right? And pus is essentially neutrophils. Um, you know, so if you have like a low bar pneumonia, you, you see an infiltrate because there's some sort of fluid there, there's pus there. In neutrophilic patients, obviously, since they don't have neutrophils, they don't have as much of a robust response that's actually going to show up on a test x-ray. So if somebody who has neutrophilic fever comes in, and especially if you're attending a Dr. Kazner, get a CT scan of her chest um, to kind of get a better evaluation of like uh, a pneumonia process. Yeah. All right. Any questions about that? Yeah, it was cold. Oh yeah, so when you get a neutropenic fever patient, um, pan culture them, getting chest x-rays, blood culture, urine culture, um, if you can get a sputum culture, you know, just looking everywhere. Other than the lungs, a common cause of neutropenic fever actually ends up being like sinusitis as well. Um, so getting like a sinus CT or something like that isn't uncommon. All right, we, ta we talked about this, right? The first line treatment is an anti-pseudomonal gram negative, um, you know, anti uh, antibiotic like cefepime um, or piptazo. And then you add bank if they truly meet sepsis criteria, they have a history of um, MRSA. And for all indications, put it up there so you can refer to it later. Okay. Um, all right, last question, I think. Anybody wanna read it? It's so long. <laughs> I don't know about you guys, but I like never knew when to use GCSF. So let's figure it out, right? Um, all right, so any, uh, who thinks that the answer is A? Who thinks the answer is B? Okay, who thinks the answer is C? Okay, and who thinks the answer is D? Got a nice little mix there. That's good. Um, all right, so let's talk about them in somewhat of an order. Dose reducing chemotherapy. Oncologists love chemotherapy and they never want to reduce the dose, especially in patients who are young, right? This is a 26 year old lady. You don't want to give them less chemotherapy. You want to just slam that body full of poison. 
Um, so, so unless there's like an actual toxicity from the drug that you're giving them, uh, there aren't really a lot of indications for reducing the, the dose. So if somebody has like an API or a hypersensitivity reaction or that kind of thing, in those cases, yes, you can reduce the dose. But otherwise, um, you know, uh, it's typically not the right answer to do dose reduce uh, based off of just neutrophilia. Starting GCSF now. Okay, so what is GCSF? Right, so what, what's its purpose in this patient? What are you hoping to accomplish? Right, more neutrophils to fight the infection and, and you know, hopefully you get better, right? Studies done in patient populations with neutropenic fever, neutropenic sepsis have actually shown that giving GCSF to patients who have neutropenic fever already does not improve outcomes. It's very controversial. It, 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 it it's almost definitively doesn't improve mortality, uh, but as far as like, length of neutropenia, neutropenia fever, or API, that kind of stuff. Those are very controversial findings. But for the purposes of our like training, GCSF in patients who already have neutropenia fever, um, it's not uh, beneficial. You know, it could be like kind of a last ditch effort to try to save someone, but in the average patient who comes in, it's not really gonna change their um, outcomes. What about starting Leviquin prophylaxis? When do we give somebody antibiotic prophylaxis? This is also a quite common question that comes up, especially in a blue one two rotation. Um, when so you know, essentially the rationale here is, if I know that the patient is going to become neutropenic, then why don't I give them an antibiotic based off of the typical life cycle of the chemotherapy um, to give them prophylaxis against you know infections? during their period of neutropenia. So in, in patients who have, um, uh, you know, neutropenia from uh, solid tumors, uh, there really aren't a lot of indications to give um, prophylaxis, like uh, antimicrobial prophylaxis, um, based off the fact that the immune system that they have is still, is not like fundamentally dysfunction, there's just less of it, this makes sense. In patients who have hematological malignancies, so AML, uh, stem cell transplants, there's a lot of evidence for giving those patients um, prophylaxis to not just um, grand negatives with like Leviquin, but also uh, antiviral prophylaxis and uh, antifungal prophylaxis during their neutrophils. Twofold reasons. One, even if they had neutrophils, they weren't working properly. And two, um, their period of neutropenia is prolonged. So they can be uh, neutropenic for weeks. Um, and so, you know, using prophylaxis in those patients is very helpful. In patients who have uh, solid tumors, their neutropenia tends to be more shorter, like to live. And for that reason, uh, routine use of prophylaxis is not recommended. So that's like your takeaway there. Is prophylaxis in heme malignancies, not solid tumors. So that just leaves us with C giving GCSF on day two of subsequent cycles of chemotherapy. That is actually the correct answer. Um, and the reason it's the right answer is there is actually only uh, one contraindication for giving GCSF and one um, true indication. So they're really tied together. The one true contraindication to GCSF is giving it concurrently with chemotherapy. It doesn't really make a lot of sense to be giving somebody a um, cell-like line stimulator at the same time as like literal poison, right? So um, the action of GCSF tends to actually cause prolonged neutropenia if you give it concurrently with chemotherapy, oddly. Um, and so we like to give it on day two because by day two, the chemotherapy is kind of washed out of the system. And that seems to be the optimal timing for like kind of prophylaxis against neutropenia for subsequent cycles. So the hope here is that we know it's going to cause neutropenia, the chemotherapy that we're giving, but by giving GCSF on day two, uh, we're trying to reduce the uh, length and the native. So don't give GCSF in patients who have neutropenia fever. Um, don't give antibiotic prophylaxis in patients who have neutropenia from solid tumors. 
and uh, don't reduce the dose of chemotherapy uh, when you can help it. Do give colony, uh, like immune blast uh, colony uh, stimulating factors in patients on day two of chemotherapy uh, because there is good evidence for reducing the duration and nadir of leukopenia in those patients, All right? Since we've run out of time, I will not talk about uh, like this, but I'm gonna leave it in our slides so you can refer to it. Uh, it, it essentially uh, is a, uh, like an overview of antibiotics again, um, just talking about uh, kind of like my approach based off of, uh, the way I think about antibiotics is I have like an anti-pseudomonal list. And so I think about all the medications that can cover pseudomonas. So you'll have a pretty um, extensive list to refer to. Um, and then you also have your anti-mersal list, which I like to break down into either IV forms, Jager Vank, Adapto, Ceftaroline, Telvanson, and then you also have your oral agents, like your linazolid, uh, Delafloxacin, Doxy, and Bactrim. Uh, so those are your oral and your IV. Once you, once you have your like anti-pseudomonal list and your MRSA list down pat, the only thing really that um, is left is thinking about your penicillin generations. And the, my general like, approach to our general, I'm uh, sorry, my general approach to penicillin um, antibiotics is essentially your basic penicillin, you have gram positive coverage. And as you um, go up on the generations, you add certain bumps. So if you're going from penicillin to ampicillin, you add gram negative. If you go from ampicillin to ampicillobactam, so getting that, or any time that you see like sulbactam, quadrilonic, or even tazobactam, you add anaerobic coverage. Going to oxicillin, you get MSSA coverage. Going to peptazo, you add pseudomonal coverage, and then going to like your ESDL. So just think about it as like as you're going up the generation, just adding another group. It's gram positives, and it's gram positive and gram negatives for AMP. Then you add the anaerobic coverage once you get to anything like plus sulbactam, and then um, once you get to like peptazo, you add the pseudomonal. I hope that's helpful. It's a good like guide and reference. Thanks for being patient. Tried to like quick talk my way through all of that. <laughs> There's a lot there. <laughs> all right. Okay. Tomorrow the lecture is in Scott Library. Yes, Scott Library. Uh, so okay. tomorrow we're going to talk about Epic. Like uh, there will be two halves to the lecture. Um, you might just depending on what room you end up in, you might end up doing like the like. Uh, electronic rounding lecture first and then more nuanced uh, use